Welcome everybody to the Leonard Davis Institute at the University of Pennsylvania's virtual seminar series. I am Rachel Warner. I'm the executive director of LDI. Today's seminar examines the impact of COVID-19 on the health of rural America. This week, we reached an unfortunate milestone in the COVID-19 pandemic as the death tolls in this country passed 100,000 people. And at the same time, the virus has made, has made a fundamental shift in who it touches and where it reaches. While it first uh, had its major impact in metropolitan areas in this country, its front line now is increasingly in this country's rural areas. Um, and some rural counties have the highest rates of COVID-19 cases and deaths in this country, topping even, even the hardest hit areas in New York City. So at this critical time in the pandemic, we have brought together an outstanding panel of experts to discuss the health of the people and the health systems in rural America, the challenges faced as a result of the pandemic, and their recommendations for supporting rural health and healthcare moving forward. So with that, I'd like to introduce today's panelists. Uh, first, we have Lisa Davis, who is the Director of the Pennsylvania Office of Rural Health and Outreach and Associate Professor of Health Policy and Administration at the Penn State University. Ms. Holmes is responsible for the overall direction and leadership of the Pennsylvania State Office on Rural Health, providing assistance to organizations focused on rural health care delivery, developing linkages with state and national partners, and seeking ways to enhance the health status of rural Pennsylvanians. She is extensive experience in rural health research and serves on numerous boards and advisory committees in the state at the national and university level. Next, we have Mark Holmes, who is a professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the University of North Carolina Healing School of Global Public Health. And he is the director of the Cecil G. Sheffs Center for Health Services Research, where he is also the director of the North Carolina Rural Health Research and Policy Analysis Center and the co-director of the Program on Healthcare Economics and Finance. Dr. Holmes is one of the nation's top rural health researchers and is a leading authority on North Carolina health policy. We are also joined by Kara James, who is the president and CEO of Grantmakers in Health, where she recently joined. Grantmakers in Health works with philanthropic organizations in the country to improve the health of all people. Prior to joining Grantmakers in Health, Dr. James served as the Director of the Office of Minority Health at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, where she advanced goals focused on reducing disparities and, and achieving health equity for vulnerable populations, including persons living in rural communities. Under her guidance, CMS developed its first rural health strategy. And then we are also finally joined by Karen Murphy, who is the Executive Vice President, Chief Innovation Officer, and Founding Director of the Steele Institute for Healthcare Innovation at Geisinger in Pennsylvania. Dr. Murphy has worked to improve um, and transform healthcare delivery in both the public and private sectors. Before joining Geisinger, she served as Pennsylvania's Secretary of Health, addressing the state's most significant health issues, including the opioid epidemic. And prior to her role as secretary, Dr. Murphy served as the director of the State Innovation Model, Models Initiative at CMS. Today's panel will be moderated by Penn's own Joanna Hart. Dr. Hart is a faculty member and attending pulmonary and critical care physician at the University of Pennsylvania, and she's a senior fellow here at LDI. Her research um, has focused on, on medical decision making, particularly under conditions of uncertainty and in serious illness. And this past year, Joanna founded the Rural Health and Policy Research Working Group here at LDI to build capacity and provide multidisciplinary and evidence-based research to improve the health of rural communities. So with that, I will turn it over to Joanna. So rural health is really the result of a complex interplay of social, economic, political, cultural, and structural factors. And the 20% of Americans who live in rural areas are generally older, have more chronic health conditions and face more occupational health risks than people living in other geographic settings. But people in rural communities are also more likely to be under or uninsured, frequently experience poverty, and often have very limited access to health care because of their setting. COVID-19 brings to light these vulnerabilities in rural areas. As Rachel mentioned, while the peak of the virus, um, the, at least the initial peak in metropolitan areas, has started, has been met and started to decline. In rural areas, many have still not reached their peak, and we're starting to see rural hotspots. And the volume and acuity of patients with COVID-19 in those areas will quickly overwhelm the very limited resources that many rural communities have, even to provide routine care. And so understanding how the viral illness is going to impact rural communities 
and how responses to it can either improve or increase disparities among people living in rural areas, and how to overcome them, those vulnerabilities become um, of critical importance to all of us, regardless of where we live. And so I'm going to start by asking Lisa Davis. Um, rural hospitals have, before COVID-19, already faced significant financial and operational limitations um, and challenges. What were some of these challenges, and how might you think that they would play into a response to COVID-19 now? Rural health has really gotten a lot of attention over the last five years or so, which is terrific. Um, and there's been a lot of attention paid to the issues related to rural hospitals. There's really sort of a convergence of issues that impact um, rural hospitals' viability. Health disparities is one of them, and you just referred to that as you were talking. Um, you know, all across the country here in Pennsylvania, we have a pretty homogenous rural population, but that is not true when you look at the southern states or you look at the states that have large numbers of Native Americans and so on. So dealing with populations that have health disparities is certainly of a concern. There's also been some population migration have seen individuals who are moving out of rural communities um, who might be healthier, who are going to other areas. And we also see perhaps um, some residents who are moving back. Here in Pennsylvania, we tend to have the highest number of people who are born and die within five miles of the same location. So they might be coming back to their rural community with significant health issues. Um, we're also, workforce recruitment and retention has been an intractable issue since I've been working in rural health. So being able to attract and retain primary care and specialty providers, especially when we're looking at substance use disorder and mental health and dental health are certainly of a concern in rural communities. There's also been um, a, a big push across the country and certainly here in Pennsylvania, and Karen Murphy has been was a big part of this when she was at the Department of Health, in being able to shape healthcare policies that take rural considerations into account um, because urban and rural are different. And the policies that work in urban areas need to be refined and modified to be able to address rural health issues. And we're also looking at economies. Uh, rural hospitals do not have the economies of scale to offset losses that they might be receiving through providing increased rates of uncompensated care or reduced payment for services through the public insurance programs. So that's also another issue. And across the country, we've looked at 130 rural hospital closures since 2010. And rural hospitals tend to have um, uh, lower days of cash on hand, um, higher rates of negative operating margins. So they have been struggling traditionally. Then when a pandemic like COVID-19 comes along and they need to essentially pivot on a dime and close down service, service lines that tend to bring in revenue, such as surgeries and um, uh, outpatient services and emergency department visits, they don't have the economies of scale to be able to rely on um, other sources of revenue that have come in. Can you or other people on the panel give us an example of how policies that might work for urban areas might not work for rural areas and some of those sort of examples of differences? When we look at, for instance, let's talk about OB services. Um, there's that golden 30 minutes that a woman in labor needs to have um, that's re recommended from the time that she goes into labor to be able to deliver in a hospital. That works really well in urban areas because there are more hospitals and those hospitals are providing OB services. We're seeing across the country that rural OB services are being discontinued. We've experienced that in Pennsylvania, um, and that puts both the mother and the child at risk. So recognizing that there is this national standard that works well in one geography but does not translate well to another geography is something that we need to consider. And I'm sure that others on the panel have um, great examples as well. I think the real policy implication um, 
comes when we talk about requirements for inpatient care, when we talk about requirements for emergency room services, the configurations of a tertiary care hospital, um, as you point out, Joanna, um, are much different in the urban areas than they are in the rural communities. And I think as policymakers, it's incumbent to really recognize um, not a one size fits all for uh, rural hospitals, but instead take a look at what a transformed uh, rural hospital would look like and what makes sense in a rural hospital as far as requirements. I think the blanket approach to say a hospital is a hospital is one that we have to diverge from and start looking at communities and community need and shaping our policy to support those transformations in rural hospitals. And I would add, um, if I could, just, you know, some of the other places in which, um, before we left CMS, they had made some changes in things like direct supervision, where you have different staffing ratios in rural hospitals compared to those urban areas that can be overly burdensome. And so those were some of the changes that we had heard a lot from rural communities about how they would be helpful to have um, changed. And those were changes that were made. So I think understanding burden and implications of what that means for different rural providers is really important. Um, and I'm sure we're going to get into this, but also just, you know, the implications for moving uh, non-emergency services and um, out of rural hospitals as we've made room for treatment for COVID has had a disproportionate impact as well, because that is a lot of, you know, those operating margins that Lisa mentioned in the beginning really sort of uh, hurt some of those rural hospitals as they're trying to figure out how to make ends meet. So Mark, when we think about sort of shaping policy and making it responsive to, you know, rural areas in addition to urban areas, um, how do you generate the sort of um, political and popular uh, investment in rural communities and making sure that policies meet the needs of those communities, particularly in the setting of something like an infectious pandemic? I think one issue is the way that data are often presented. And you know, here I'm an economist talking about data, of course, but um, you know, a lot of the media coverage that I've seen has talked about total number of cases by county, for example, which of course makes the urban uh, communities accurately represents the burden of those cases. And I've had epidemiologists explain to me why that's the right way to think about disease spread rather than per capita, but that's fine. But from the burden from the community standpoint, per capita may, may make sense if you think about sort of like your probability of running into someone uh, who's infectious. And so everything from how we present the data is that per capita or total number can really change how we think about, you know, the, the, um, the issue. When we talk about hospitals, for example, um, you know, you can see, a, you can find pie graphs that show what percent of all hospitals are rural. Uh, but the pie graph that goes next to that should be what percent of, of uh, Medicare expenditures goes to those. And that's important when you think about policy. And so uh, different uh, policy efforts have been targeting uh, some of these special rural hospital provisions that aim to address some of the um, uh, challenge, financial challenges that Professor Davis alluded to and, you know, critical access hospital and you know, Medicare dependent hospital and things like that. And uh, when you target those, you're uh, arguing that, well, on a per case basis, on a per diem basis, uh, the payment is higher than it might be in other settings. But what that often fails to recognize is the total amount is far less than what you would get in, you know, looking at other settings. The other aspect to think about, and so that you can think about these in terms of like, what is the proper metric would be one way to think about that. I think another important element is to recognize uh, the role of the rural community in our tapestry of American life. And wow, does that sound like a great book or something like that? But um, how we're, you know, everything from um, the three F's that rural communities often bring, food, fuel, and fun, and that role uh, around the America uh, experience overall. And certainly we've seen as, as COVID-19 has, has uh, been affected by meatpacking for example, outbreaks and the pressure that that's put on our food uh, supply chain. Um, the fuel uh, notion, we haven't seen a lot of that uh, currently, but if you think about what would happen in refineries and, and uh, oil production fields that um, uh, may be disproportionately located in rural areas or coal mines, for example, 
And then fun, some of the initial uh, rural outbreaks occurred in uh, destination communities. I'm thinking in particular about you know, the uh, Pacific Northwest as, uh, as uh, urban residents were looking for alternative places and ski resorts were, were a common element. So the, the notion of um, the rural communities over there, I don't have to worry about it because I don't live there. Uh, not only is it a, um, an, an exchange for those three Fs, but also uh, anytime that you're driving uh, down one of our interstate highways, you're often in a rural community. And it sure benefits me to know that there's an operating rural hospital that's ready in case I have a motor vehicle accident or uh, have an MI in that, in that framework. And Mark or others, um, can you talk a little bit about sort of the demographic makeup or the sort of structural factors other than the ones we've already talked about that might make rural communities and the people who live in communities um, that are in sort of rural locations at higher risk for either contracting COVID-19 or having sort of poor outcomes after contracting the virus? You know, in general, uh, rural communities are considered, being from a rural community is considered to be a protective characteristic. Um, you're in a community where you are, you have deep roots. Everyone seems to know each other. Essentially, everyone is related to everybody else. Um, there's this strong connection to school and to church and to community. Um, there is, on the flip side of that, of course, a, a lack of anonymity. Um, but I think that what we've been seeing here in Pennsylvania is exactly what Mark was alluding to that these communities were essentially for a, a time a bit immune to COVID-19 because they were in fact fairly insular, they're geographically isolated, um, or there are, you know, in, in, in our state we have really big hills and um, streams and rivers and such that keep things pretty well um, uh, sequestered in one spot. However, what we are starting to see in this state and what we've heard from hospital CEOs is that when they drive into work now, they drive by the hunting camps and the, um, the vacation homes, especially up in the Poconos, where, just as Mark said, people have migrated from the urban areas to the rural communities. They are not isolating in their, in, in their hunting camp or their vacation home. And they are bringing with them whatever germs they might be carrying with them. They're going out into the community. They're going shopping. They may not be wearing a mask. And if they then need services, they're going to be going to the small rural hospital. And although those hospitals in our state are well prepared to address COVID-19, then suddenly we're looking at putting a whole new population at risk. I think another comment that um, gravely concerned me looking at rural communities uh, in regards to COVID is that it is well documented that the health outcomes of those in rural communities are inferior to their urban counterparts. We know now that COVID, had, uh, COVID really impacts those with comorbid conditions such as chronic diseases, hypertension, congestive heart failure, pulmonary disease, at a much more severe um, at a at a much more severe rate, and we're seeing that. And I think the concern in terms of looking at just even the um, population in rural communities, they tend um, they tend to be much sicker than um, those in uh, urban populations. So not only do rural hospitals have the burden of um, being short in terms of um, being challenged because they have uh, certainly a smaller, a shorter bench, but also potentially the patients could be a lot sicker um, because of their pre-existing conditions with COVID. The other thing I would add that we generally don't in the context of uh, rural health is the role of intergenerational households during this pandemic, um, at least in North Carolina, and I've, I don't think I've looked nationally, um, intergenerational hospital uh, households are more common in non-metro areas, and given we the role we know of um, prolonged exposure in interior settings, that that's a big risk factor. And you know, especially as we reach the fall and schools are going to start reopening, um, you know, we've we've seen certain um, you know the, the predominant evidence is that uh, Kawasaki uh, disease aside, that uh, school-age children tend to be 
less infectious and less affected by it, but as a vector for the grandparents they're co-living with, the um, um, those who are at that high risk, that is something that we need to think about. And it's not um, something we normally put on our list of things to consider with asthma and hypertension when we're talking about rural, but that's another component to consider. I guess one other, uh, if I can grab the mic again, one other, one other component would be um, the ability to uh, quarantine. And everything from the nature of the work in rural settings uh, compared to urban, um, you know, there's 192 of us on here who are effectively working, um, probably most of us from home, uh, using our broadband connection. Um, that, that, you know, that experience is going to be different in urban settings than in rural. Um, the nature of the work, the degree to which there's a large employer that's able to shift uh, to remote more quickly. Um, the other services that enable uh, staying at home more effectively in urban settings, everything, you know, I'm thinking about grocery delivery, fast food delivery, you know, uh, those kinds of services are also less common in rural areas and make it more incumbent upon people often to, to travel outside the home. Um, one of the populations that we've done a lot of outreach to is the Amish and Mennonite population. Um, Pennsylvania has a very large Amish population um, in, in Lancaster County and throughout the state. We actually have um, the second largest. I think Ohio is greater than us. But um, what we were hearing is that um, there were some misconceptions among the Mennonite community about um, the origin of COVID-19, um, whether or not it was actually hype or it was a, a serious issue that they needed to pay attention to. We did not see isolating and certainly Amish population, Amish and Mennonite tend to congregate in very large groups. So we were not seeing social distancing. We were not seeing the wearing of masks. So there was a great deal of education that came out from the uh, the groups that work with the Mennonite population, Amish and Mennonite population, the Anabaptists, to try and do some education about this because they are also um, interacting with the non-Anabaptist population and talking with friends of mine who actually transport Amish folks who were doing education about why they should wear a mask and why it should be important to really reduce the number of times that they were together. So I think that is a special population that other states may not be experiencing, but certainly we're uh, concerned about here in the state. Karen, Geisinger has really for a long time had sort of community and population health as sort of a built-in mission as um, their system. Um, it's a priority and a mission of Geisinger's how has Geisinger responded in innovative ways to dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic in a health system that serves a predominantly rural population? Really, Geisinger's system experienced very much like what we've seen across the country in that it's a tale of two worlds. So we have hospitals in more densely populated urban, not urban, not large urban, but um, the northeast part of the state was particularly hard hit, uh, Lackland and Luzerne counties. And our rural communities, the numbers were significantly, uh, significantly lower. However, we, we concentrated on um, determining population health initiatives in an innovative way for all of our markets. And in our rural communities, um, you know, a couple of the things we did was, um, like everyone else, is try to get the care to the home, um, try to connect with the patient where they were, as opposed we canceled all of our, um, obviously, elective work coming in, even in the communities where we didn't see uh, large numbers of COVID to date, but um, really doubled down on digital strategies, um, remote monitoring and also um, virtual visits. And um, we have been luckier than most in terms of broadband in our the rural communities we serve. I know that um, Lisa knows, like up in Potter County, the northern part of the state, broadband is really challenged. Um, we have been very fortunate that um, our areas have had pretty decent broadband coverage, and it has enabled us um, to really continue to care for the patients virtually. Um, in their homes so that they did not have to come out and um, enter the actual healthcare delivery system. 
So um, I think the 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 pandemic, um, we say we have to look for the silver linings because as hard as this has been, um, it has challenged us on how do we move forward to meet the needs of our patients. And I think um, we've all learned that um, connecting virtually is is something that we want to continue and and really build on coming out of the pandemic. And that has been particularly helpful in our rural communities. Kara, I think that there have been um, many health systems that have started to deploy, obviously nationwide, many more sort of telehealth modalities. Um, but we know that COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting sort of pre-existing to be vulnerable communities. So communities that may be lower income may not have either the um, access to things like broadband or uh, sort of digital technologies owned by the patient. And so how might the reliance on telehealth, particularly in rural areas, kind of worsen existing disparities, even though we make innovations to try to connect with many people? And it sounds like in Karen and in Geisinger's health system, many of their patients um, do have broadband access. But as Mark points out, nationally, rural areas are obviously challenged by that. It's an important question. And I think just to underlie some of the pre-existing issues that were in rural communities, um, and particularly as we've heard nationally about some of the challenges that American Indians in particular are facing in the Navajo Nation. I'm also reminded that, you know, last year in September, um, part of the Navajo Nation got just got electricity. So, you know, forget 5G as we talk about in terms of broadband, there's some people who are still waiting on like 1G. And what that means are people who in rural communities, kids who are driving to areas and more urban spaces where they can get Wi-Fi connection to be able to participate in school. Um, those are some real challenges that also have implications for the ability to participate in telehealth um, and telehealth being pretty broad that may not include video. It may just be a phone call that someone has where it makes it harder to look at issues that they may be facing. Um, I think also some of the issues that we think about for some of the vulnerable populations um, you've heard already from Lisa and Karen about some of the income disparities that we see between urban and rural communities, and those are magnified in some of our rural communities of color who have higher rates of poverty um, than some of those white individuals in rural areas. So the ability to even pay for minutes or um, internet service of broadband um, also becomes a bit of an issue for some of those communities and what's offered uh, to them and their ability to participate. Um, so those are a couple of the issues that kind of help impact um, telehealth and what's available. And I think the other one I would say is just we've also heard in some of the communities that um, they, again, going back to some of those operating costs and the challenges there, some of the community health centers or other hospitals haven't necessarily the resources to purchase the uh, electronic capabilities to expand telehealth. So it makes it even harder for those communities to take advantage. So there's been a great um, opening up of telehealth, but not all communities, I think, are able to participate in it equally. And it's something that we need to keep an eye on to make sure that we don't see worse disparities. And when you were at CMS, you worked on also sort of financial viability and workforce stabilization in rural communities and health systems. Um, and can you talk a little bit about the implications for that during a pandemic where there may not be a workforce that can flex to take on sort of a surge of COVID um, patients who are requiring inpatient or outpatient management? Lisa's already touched on some of that in terms of just the bench strength that's there in rural communities when you don't have, you know, workforce is already a challenge to recruit and retain individuals in rural communities and to train them to be able to practice. Um, I think that those issues in a pandemic do become magnified and have the potential really to become magnified because um, as we've seen nationally, a number of healthcare providers have actually gotten infected and, and unfortunately in some cases succumbed to the disease. So if that happens in a rural community and you had the one provider or the two providers or, you know, that that really makes it a lot harder for people to get the care that they need, but also who's going to help there to make sure they're able to come back and, and support the community. Um, so I think, again, just making sure that we're aware and seeing where those places where they have been hard hit 
um, because just even though the numbers are smaller, um, a couple of cases can really overwhelm a system just because of the small numbers in there. Um, think about hospitals that are critical access hospitals, no more than 25 beds. It's not a lot of people, not a lot of workforce to think about. Um, so a couple of cases really can push a community over the edge. So bouncing off of that, so there you have done a lot of work on hospital closures as well um, over your career. Um, can you talk a little bit about are there enough beds in rural communities and you know hospital beds? And if there aren't enough hospital beds in rural communities, then what happens when the COVID pandemic surges there? So enough is a tough term, right? Um, and it, given some of the early models of the epidemiology, you know, I don't think anyone really had enough. Um, you know, we did some early work back um, in, in March, I think, uh, in the first couple of weeks of, of when things were starting to heat up to look at, um, at exactly this question, capacity um, and also unused capacity to know what percent of available beds are typically uh, used in a, in, a, in a, you know, on average over the year. Um, and when you look at a per capita basis, and for example, um, RUPRI, the Rural Policy uh, Research Institute out of University of Iowa, uh, is doing some work to track this and look at ICU beds per case effectively and show where um, and really balance that, that question of, um, of the demand as well as the supply and show where at places where that might be more at, uh, at odds. We seen, um, you know, Alabama seems to be um, facing some challenges in, in the next, uh, currently. Um, but I think, you know, one thing to think about is uh, we need to think about the regional uh, aspect here. And um, it's probably not the case that the rural hospital will be exclusively responsible for managing all the care in that community, if in particularly um, high infection and case rates, uh, some transfers to other neighboring um, in North Carolina, we've looked at a recently closed rural hospital and are positioning it as a surge facility um, should the need arise. And this particular facility is about two hours from all urban areas and well, many of the largest urban areas in the state. So it's very well positioned to act as that that uh, that surge capacity uh, function. Um, for us, it has a double value in that um, uh, as hurricane season starts, what, Monday, uh, in Southeast United States, that's another thing that we should think about. But um, uh, back to your original question, I mean, I think we know that there are fewer acute beds and fewer ICU beds per capita in rural areas than in urban. The question as to how that demand is managed, um, you know, that that's one I think that uh, each state and uh, region is going to have to consider. Um, do we want to systematically transfer um, the, the high acuity cases to a, uh, a larger facility that has um, greater cap capability um, in terms of free, in terms of numbers. I have a friend from rural Midwest and their local hospital has one ventilator. Uh, and so going back to Dr. James's point about the, the thin margins that some of these places are operating on with one respiratory therapist, if that ventilator is, uh, is in use, um, then uh, the person needs it's going to have to go somewhere else. Following up on what Mark said about capacity, um, what we've been seeing in our small rural hospitals in the state, especially with our 15 critical access hospitals, which, um, as folks have pointed out, are 25 beds or less, is that they actually have a lot of capacity for several reasons. One is that they have segregated out a unit just for COVID-19 patients, which they're not really seeing because anyone who's coming to the facility um, and is testing positive is actually being treated at home. They are also seeing that um, people are not coming to the emergency department. They're afraid to come to the hospital. They're afraid to be admitted for anything um, because they're afraid of contracting the disease. So what, what we're seeing is that in, in some cases, um, even though hospitals have laid off staff and they've closed some units, there's a lot of unused capacity within these hospitals and they're losing money every day. Because as I, as we were talking about earlier, you know, they're not performing surgery. So that's not leading to any sort of inpatient services. They're not doing anything outpatient 
and and rural residents are afraid to come for fear that they um, will contract the, the disease. So what are some of the payment models that might work well um, or that could be implemented or are being implemented um, in rural areas that can help support a stable healthcare system both during and after COVID? We have one program here in Pennsylvania, and I'm actually going to defer to Karen to talk about this because this was her brainchild. Um, so Karen, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but um, we have in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania uh, Rural Health Model, which is a global payment system that was uh, uh, proposed by Karen and implemented by her. And what we are hearing from the hospitals, and I, I, I don't want this to be like the official word that comes out from the Department of Health, because that certainly would be inaccurate. And I'm not, I, I don't speak for the Department of Health, but what we have heard is for those hospitals that are participating in the global budget model, they are very grateful that they chose to participate because they are not looking now at the variation of their payment from month to month um, for those services that, um, or for, for those, those insurers that are participating. So Karen, if you don't mind, um, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I think I should defer to you as the person who could really speak intelligently to this. Oh, thank you, Lisa. But you could, too, because you were there from the very beginning. So um, as Lisa said, um, we began to look at rural communities and how they were struggling, how the rural hospitals were struggling. And we developed an approach based on the Maryland global payment model to pay um, rural hospitals prospectively a global budget. So in other words, it was not volume dependent, recognizing that many of the challenges that we talked about today um, are all exacerbated by the fee-for-service model. So the hospitals paid on fee-for-service are paid per number of services they deliver in a, in a rural communities where hospital services are declining. Um, it has really contributed a fee-for-service system has really contributed to their financially challenged status. So this global budget is an all-payer, so a multi-payer, so payers come together and agree on the methodology and they prospectively pay uh, rural hospitals a global budget. But I think more importantly, it required participation in this model is that it provides rural hospitals with a glide path to transformation. So for all the reasons we talked about today, the likelihood of having robust acute care facilities in every rural community is just not a realistic uh, expectation. So we encouraged um, hospitals to develop a transformation plan to look at their community needs and develop their services accordingly. And for that, they are paid um, on a global budget. So um, many of the urban counterparts um, in, through this pandemic have really suffered financially. I mean, Geisner as a, as a whole has suffered um, really because we did the right thing to meet the needs of our community at the time. We canceled our elective surgeries. We focused on taking care of COVID patients. Um, we really shifted everything we could to home and yet the financing uh, of that it really has led to very, very challenging, uh, very, very challenging um, economic situation that's gonna be with us for a long time to come. Rural hospitals that are on the global budget, as Lisa said, they didn't have to worry about what volume they had because their um, reimbursement scheme continued. And I think when we were um, writing and developing the model, we also um, considered really an extraordinary circumstance like a pandemic. So um, what do we do in the case of extraordinary circumstances? So that's even also figured in um, the global budget. So, um, you know, I think for rural hospitals, there's national legislation now. We're thrilled um, based on the pending national legislation that is going to be introduced um, that actually calls on uh, CMS to expand um, the test of global budgets in rural hospitals. But I think based on um, what we're seeing in Pennsylvania,
while the model is not perfect, I think we have a tremendous opportunity here to transform uh, rural health by transforming their payment methodology. On a related topic, really this is to anyone who feels like they can speak to this. Um, so Medicaid expansion was done, sort of states made their own decisions about whether or not to expand Medicaid. Have you seen how that has played into either the COVID response or the impact of COVID on rural communities or um, statewide in states that elected to expand Medicaid or not? What's been, um, uh, I think, really analyzed across the country and determined is that for states that expanded Medicaid, they saw fewer hospital closures. And here in Pennsylvania, it's made a, an enormous difference especially when you are looking at a group of hospitals that have a high reliance on Medicare and Medicaid, being able to have those opportunities to have patients um, be funded to come to your hospital makes a big difference. For the state's critical access hospitals, um, you know, Met, uh, Medicare pays um, cost base 101%. Here in Pennsylvania, we have been very fortunate to have the state um, make up the shortfall between what the hospitals get through the Medicaid program and what they would get with the 101 percent. And that shortfall funding comes to them every spring, um, right, right about now, um, or in April. And um, that has made the difference for our critical access hospitals in being able to stay open or being forced to close. So when we looked at the the increase in the number of patients who were now um, supported through Medicaid, we saw a very favorable increase in the amount of support that went to those hospitals. So I think that Medicaid expansion is a, is a very large component of being able to have vi viability with facilities. So, Kara, could you talk also about how sort of cross-sector collaborations across you know, health systems and governmental organizations and sort of philanthropic or nonprofit organizations or community organizations might come together to influence rural health, both in the setting of COVID, but also more broadly. As we think about these issues, and as we've seen in a number of places where people have been successful, there is no one entity or organization that's going to be able to fix the problems that we have in rural communities. These are not things that arose overnight, they're not gonna be solved overnight, and it will take kind of all of us working together. There are, I think, a number of collaborations that have been really helpful, um, particularly in responding to home with philanthropy who have been helping local communities to get PPE and other equipment needs um, to do rapid funding for support and response to provide testing and those sorts of issues. Um, I think we will see those continue, but there also is an opportunity as we think about um, no one wants to go back to business as usual. Um, definitely when we think about our rural and vulnerable populations that we've had, going back to where we were is not a good place because as we already have heard about the number of rural hospitals that are closed, the higher chronic conditions and other disparities that we see. So how do we rebuild? Um, our healthcare system to be, and, and not just healthcare, but our health system to be an actual health system that's making sure that people have the resources and the knowledge that they need to be able to stay healthy and get the care that they need. So um, already, uh, you know, with models such as the accountable health communities, there's, you know, philanthropy is playing a role in supporting those models and their role participants in that to make sure that we're addressing the social determinants of health and food and housing needs, um, which are particular challenges in rural communities. And it's you know something I think a lot of people don't think about given the number of farming, um, food uh, packing, meat packing, or other plants in rural areas to think about food shortages in rural communities is something I think that needs to get more attention and pay attention to. Um, but those are also opportunities and there are philanthropy working with um, USDA and with other communities to help address a lot of these needs. Um, groups focus on social isolation because for those who are doing social distancing, that disconnection between friends and families can be hard. And um, if they're not having that engagement for a lot of, as we know, unmet health care needs that are kind of going um, untreated during this time where people aren't going to get care for a variety of reasons. 
Um, and then the last thing I would just say is that there's opportunity as well to continue education and empowerment. Um, this has obviously been a situation where there's been a lot of different messages um, that have reached people. And uh, Lisa talked about some of what's happening in the Mennonite community in terms of what their thinking is and beliefs about the, the virus, but it's not just there. It's across the country where we have people who aren't sure, um, not sure where to turn for accurate information. And that is leading to increased risky behaviors um, and particularly in populations that already have vulnerabilities um, that could make not just this, but also longer term issues worse. So I think there's real opportunity and already seeing good examples of collaboration, but thinking about how do we build on that to get more sort of regional approaches to healthcare, additional sort of models of payment that can support that and to expand um, access. And just one last point, uh, going back to the Medicaid conversation, I think you know, these next couple of years are gonna be really challenging because we know states are gonna be struggling with the unemployment rate how many people are actually going to be without coverage who would, you know, probably qualify for Medicaid, but also state budgets that have to be balanced and the resources that's going to be needed to support those communities, I think is really a, another issue that we're seeing that's going to be coming up um, in the next very short while. What would be your top recommendation to policymakers, either at the state or the national federal level? Um, who are looking to support rural health care and rural communities um, going forward, uh, living through COVID-19 and then moving I've forward. been thinking about this one a lot. Um, and I think that a lot of people have written about how this is an inflection point for our country and um, for us to really think about how do we build a better mousetrap. And, I, you know, looking back, um, people have compared the unemployment rate to the Great Depression and talked about the impact that this is having. And it's something to think about when we look at the Great Depression. The New Deal was in effect for effectively six years. And there were multiple efforts that came out of that initially in 1933 and again in 1955 to really bolster and think about how do we support our, our communities going forward to help them. And if we think about this as an inflection point, I, I think something similar to that, and even before COVID, a number of folks in rural communities talked about um, one of the things that came out in the New Deal was that it electrified rural communities and that we sort of needed a second New Deal to get broadband across rural communities to help um, support their viability. And it's not just from a standpoint of telehealth, but we've already talked about education, employment, being able to work from home in your house. And, and so I do think that we need to, as hard as it is and as challenging as it is, we really do need to be bold and think big about long-term efforts to improve. We're not gonna be able to piecemeal this through one policy action, um, but it's going to take a long sustained effort and continued support, because I think that we still haven't quite reached the tipping point of support to really address the issues in rural communities. Um, and I think, I would hope that this has showcased particularly how interdependent we all are on each other, um, and that if we don't have um, all of us sort of healthy and thriving, then it really makes it harder for any of us to be healthy and thrive. So my recommendation would be to be bold and think long term, which is hard and not something that our government really thinks about from one legislative section to another. but really how do we put in a sustained effort to make these improvements to build a healthier community? I think, Joanna, the one thing I would add to Kara's point is um, heretofore, the advocacy for rural hospitals has been by rural communities. And we've kind of isolated rural hospitals to say, you know, it's a rural problem, it's not an urban problem. And I think we have to come together as a country and start looking at rural hospitals as a part of our healthcare ecosystem. And it is incumbent upon policymakers to actually say to urban counterparts, we have to figure this out together. So in other words, what I'm saying is large, healthy, uh, economically stable hospitals in urban areas have to partner to figure out how to support 
rural hospitals, particularly in those services that they can't and never will be able to deliver, but yet help those uh, rural hospitals really address um, the issues of access. Um, it, we've talked about virtual visiting. There's a lot we can do in rural communities. Um, and I, I think we have to stop isolating rural as only the people from rural communities advocating. I think we have to advocate for rural um, hospitals as an, as an industry and not just as an isolated, um, you know, unfortunate community. And Joanna, this is Lisa, following up on what Karen and Kara said, um, you know, this is not a rural versus urban issue. This is looking at the continuum of care across all geographies. And, you know, here in Pennsylvania, we're seeing as uh, across all the, the entire country, a lot of buyouts, acquisitions, and so on. And um, it, it, I think it's incumbent upon um, health systems to understand that these rural communities and these rural hospitals that they are acquiring are not a feeder into the larger system, that they need to invest in that community because that is where they may get the biggest gain is investing in that community, making sure that that community is healthy through all of the things that we've talked about um, and not just something that they're gobbling up um, and and are going to be feeding over to the mothership. So I think looking at this holistically is imperative in being able to uh, uh, address disparities across all geographies and populations. And COVID nineteen you know, is is a is a great opportunity for that because nothing is ever going to be like it was in March or January of this year, whether it's rural or urban. And if I could just build on one point, I think that it's also um, we've talked a lot about the rural hospitals, but, you know, it's really the rural health system that we have. And we think about already um, Mark's team does a great job tracking the hospital closures, but we've already seen a lot of nursing home closures as well. In rural communities, we think about needs of people on dialysis and other services. Is um, so, you know, sort of primary care, especially as our healthcare system is shifting people from inpatient to outpatient in community settings, what is the structure that's there to support that so that people can stay healthy? So we just encourage us to expand the conversation beyond the hospitals, which are clearly the beacon that everybody recognizes, but there's so much care that is provided in the community and it goes from hospital, hospice, home health, all of that, that is important. Mark, do you want to give us your top recommendation? I don't, recommendation want, to, I don't want to follow those three great answers. <laughs> You're gonna, it's like having a Grateful Dead play three great songs and then have, doing a cover of something else after that. So I'm going to let those stand and be the, the final word. Those were three exceptional answers. So. Great, Rachel, I'm going to pass it back to you for some closing well, thoughts. Well, thank you guys all so much for the conversation today. And Joanna, thank you for moderating. I think um, this was a terrific uh, conversation about um, rural health and how it's been affected during COVID-19. I think like everything, COVID-19 has revealed the cracks in the healthcare system and society at large, and rural health is no, is no different. And so I think we can take what we've learned today and think about how to build a stronger health system across the entire spectrum. So thanks everyone for joining us today um, and be well and stay safe.